and gentlemen, welcome to the main event. Nothing here, so how about here? Satan's ready to fight. He's going to take out audio, but we got Dustin, amen, and Jesus. Somebody say, praise Jesus. Hey, we, uh, we are in a series called Fighting Not Against, but For Families, Fighting for families. And we're not just talking about your family. We're talking about the family of God. We're talking about relationships, your children. We're talking about everything that's got us involved in. We're supposed to be fighting for, not against. There's a lot of fighting going on there, isn't there? Outside, in the world. How many have been to Walmart lately? How many have been uh, on social media? There's fighting on TV. There's fighting everywhere. Everywhere you go, it's polarity. It's fighting. It's pitting one against the other. Seems like everyone is fighting. I think we're in like a fight club culture right now. That's kind of how it feels like you're tense. Anyone feel tense outside? When you leave your house, you die, or maybe in your house, you just feel a little tense. Like, what is going on? Where's the peace of Jesus right now? Over 20 years of ministry, I've seen so much fighting in families, in relationships, and, and it just seems like it's getting worse and worse. It's tense. People come to me and say, Pastor, how do I get my spouse to do that? He won't do this, and she won't do that, or she won't stop doing this, or my kids won't obey and do this, or my parents won't obey and give me all this. Amen? It's like there's a lot of that, do this, do, don't do that. A lot of behaviors that are going astray. A lot of actions that don't seem to be in alignment with what we want. Amen? And because of that, there's a lot of tension. Facebook seems to be one big reality TV show right now, right? Seems like there's so much tension on there. Nobody seems to be happy with anyone else except for themselves and their latest selfie. They're happy about that. But after that selfie, it's all out war. And it seems like the whole country has a behavioral issue. Like, like everyone needs to just go and time out for a week. That's what we need. Just shut it all down and go to time out for a week. I think we need help. Amen? I think we need some serious help because things are not getting better. Marriages and families are falling apart, and we're in a war zone. And if things don't get better, life is going to look a whole lot different than some of us remember in the 80s. Amen? 80s were great. Go 80s. But it ain't the 80s anymore. Something is changing right before our eyes. But God, God has a plan for us when it comes to families, relationships, parenting, and even church. And today, God's given me a fight plan to lay out for you guys. A fight plan for our families that are going to give us hope that we can go from fighting against one another, fighting against our children, fighting against our spouses, fighting against the world, to fighting for each other. And fighting for what God has. God's got a plan to help to us turn this thing around. Where we can stop looking to others, other authorities, other governments, other laws to turn things around. And actually say, we can get this done because God's given us a plan. Anyone believe that? Most of you are going to believe it in about 10 minutes because it's going down. So on 30% now, but 70%, and by the time we're done, we're all going out for war. It's going to be all on like Donkey Kong. Somebody say amen. amen. Are we all in to fight for this thing called family and community and the world that Jesus is after? Well, here's your disclaimer. The fight plan is going to be clear, but it's not going to be easy. I didn't get up here to give you an easy plan, a quick fix, like the fast food culture wants. This is not going to be easy. It's not going to, it's not going to be a piece of cake. If you look like healthy families, like Holly and my family or Jeff and Stacy's family, we're not some anointed family. This comes easy. It takes a lot of work. 
It's that four-letter word we don't love so much, work. We have a great marriage because of work. We've raised great, raised great kids because of work, self-sacrifice, sweat. And that's what it's going to take. Now are you still in? Do you still believe in God's plan enough to say, that's it, just tell me what it's about because I'm in? Who say, who, if you're in, say amen. amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we already are, are receiving your call and your invitation to something greater because we all feel the tension, the battleground, the war zone in our families and the world, and it's not getting better. We're frustrated or some of us are losing hope. Some of us have lost hope. But God, you always give us the hope. You always give us the plan. And all you're asking us to do is listen, receive, and step in to what you'd have us do. I pray for that in this church today. There's somebody here that's got an absolute war zone in their family. They're going to hear things. You're going to set them free and give them victory. There's, there are people here that are, that are in relationships or maybe at their job or their neighbors, and it's an absolute battleground. And, Lord, you're going to give them news today, instructions today to, to gain victory and set freedom within these relationships. Lord, the hope of this country and this world is found in this battle plan because it's what you did for us through Jesus Christ. So I pray, Lord, that we would receive it and step into it and fight with you for what's right. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, let's go. Our working passage today, by the way, I'm going to be going fast. This is strategic, right? It's intentional, so get out your notes, get out your Bibles. It's going to be one, two, three, okay? Some of you are like, already, what's wrong with Pastor Mike? Did somebody tinkle in his Cheerios or something? He looks like he's all pent up or something. No, man, it's, well, this is serious stuff, right? we got to get to the plan. So turn, turn in your Bibles, get out your notes. We're going to Deuteronomy chapter 6. That's our working passage for our families, relationships, and our communities. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. This passage is known as the Shema. It's the central focus of the Hebrew people, right? Because it's the pinnacle of how they were supposed to live with God and live with each other. And we're going to go back to that and find a strategic fight plan for how we do families correctly under God's name. So go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. It starts like this. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road. Unless you're watching Netflix, then you can pick up. No, it doesn't say that. When you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Somebody say 24-7. I just want to make sure we get the context here. This passage became the pinnacle passage for the Hebrew people for the, their whole lives. And you can see it contains one of, the, one of the two greatest commandments that Jesus used to sum up all the commands. The other being, love your neighbor as yourself. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And these weren't just a couple of good suggestions, amen? Amen? The Lord goes on to tell Moses that he's about to take them into the promised land. He's got a vision for his people. There's going to be great big cities there. They're going to be infiltrating into those cities, trying to take them over. There's a new world. There's foreign people. There's foreign philosophies. There's foreign gods. And he's telling them, I don't want them to pollute you. Therefore, this is the passage you need to stick by. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then love each other that way and impress this upon your children and the children's children because I've got a plan for you. And your plan is not just to be sitting in a promised land, he says later, to be a light unto the world, to my name. That's the plan. This is huge. They had a purpose. They had a game plan. Purpose and a game plan. So interesting that God gave them that fight strategy and they got away from it so quickly. But we don't want to do that. So today I'm going to give you four instructions in a fight plan that I want you to take notes with. Because you can utilize these in your very lives right now. If you don't have kids with your marriage, if you don't have marriage with your relationships, you can utilize these four instructions right now in your fight plan. So take out your notes. Let's go. Your first instruction for a fight plan is get in the right fight. Don't get in the wrong fight. How many have been in the wrong fight? 
yeah, Chris been in the wrong fight. You know, I shouldn't be in this fight, right? So many of us are in the wrong fight. If you look at this passage, if you aren't careful, you zone in, you focus in on the commands, the do's and the don'ts, the do's and the don'ts, the do's and the don'ts. And we love this as parents because we want them to do and the don't the way we tell them to do and the don't, right? And we focus in on obedience and good behavior. We start fighting about behavior, amen? How many fight a little bit in your families about behavior, Okay, because that's what this thing's about. And that, unfortunately, this is what the Pharisees made this passage about. And Jesus was correcting them constantly. You're in the wrong fight. You're in the wrong fight. The behavior fight is not the right fight. That is not your fight. The real issues about your kids are not their behaviors. You're thinking, oh, you don't know my kids. The real issues about your spouse is not the way he's acting. Oh, you don't know my husband. Yeah, I is one. I get that. We have bad behaviors sometimes. But behaviors are just symptoms of a deeper issue. Listen to that. Behaviors are just symptoms of a deeper issue. And if you keep fighting the symptoms, you'll never get to the deeper issue. You'll just get exhausted. It's like if you have deep migraines for three months and you go to the doctor and, and he looked you over and he finally says, well, here you go. I'm going to give you Advil and Tylenol and you're going to be fine. You'll get through life. And, you, and all the while you go home thinking there's got to be something else. I'm looking for a tumor. I'm with something. Three months of migraines, but you just pop Advil and Advil. Migraines just keep coming back. Hey, welcome to the world today. There's more pharmaceuticals to hide what's really going on under here, right? But that's what's happening in families when we keep fighting about behaviors because they're just symptoms. Look at the passage again, and here's what you see. God is not after behavior. He's after the heart. The whole message is about your heart. Get, I love the message translation. Not that I study thoroughly from it. I actually like the Greek and the Hebrew. But the message sometimes just hits you where it counts. He says, get God into your heart. And then get God into your children's hearts. Is that what the passage says, right? I mean, get him into your heart and get him into your children's heart. Why? Because God knows we have a heart problem, not an action problem. That's the problem. The passage is not about how we're acting outwardly. It's about how we process life and God inwardly. So our fight isn't for our behavior. Our fight is for the heart. Everything in our relationships, marriages, kids is about the heart. Jesus says in Luke chapter 6, what comes out of the mouth of a man is what's overflowing from the heart. It's a heart issue. Jesus is telling us what controls the heart controls the person. So what do you need to get to? We need to get to the heart. You can keep running out buying parenting books and marriage books to control the behavior that your hubby acts like this, like you want him to take out the trash, like you trick him to do this or whatever else. Or, and guess what? You'll get a little relief, but eventually another problem will, will pop up. Or you might buy parenting books and make your children look like shiny little Pharisees by the time they leave the house. Like, oh, they do everything perfect. Guess what happens when they leave the house? They don't do things so perfect. It's nightmare. Because it's not about the behavior. They're going to have problems deeper in their life because you never got to the heart. God says, get me in your heart. Fight for the hearts. So every, and your notes, if you got your notes, every one of these uh, points has an applicational step for you. So here's your first one. Here's what you do about this. When behavior is going bad, don't start fighting about the action. Don't put on your mitts and start fighting about action, but take a step back and see what's going on in the heart. All right? Don't start barking commands. Start asking questions. Now, why would you do that? What's going on in there that's causing this? Does that make sense? It takes somebody that's going to be above all this to say, see what's going on and ask the right questions. You can't put up with bad behavior, but that shouldn't be the fight. You still have, you still have guardrails. You still have boundaries, but you ask questions to get at what's going deeper. Okay, that's number one, get in the right fight. The second instruction is to establish the win. You need to establish the win. No general, no coach, no commander goes into a fight without knowing what the real win is. I like to call this, get a vision. Get a vision for your families, for your life. Do you know what the win is, the vision is for your marriage? Do you know what the vision God has for your children is? Do you know what he wants for your family? Vision is one of those things that it, it talks about eye vision, but it's really, a, it's really a heart thing. It's a heart vision for what's in the future. 
And if you've got a clear vision for something, it'll actually give you energy to move towards it. As soon as you see something clear, you actually get motivation to move towards it. How do I know this? When Holly gets a vision of a dress she wants, we're either in the car in 10 minutes headed to Ross, or if I hid the key, she's already bought it on Amazon. You get a clear vision. I know I'm in trouble later, but you get a clear vision, and there's momentum that comes from vision. How do I know this? You, anytime you see something like, hey, you know, there's a brand new car and you pass in the car lot, guess what? You're fighting not turning in to check out that car. You see Mickey ears like Pastor Jeff loves Disney. He's like, ah, when are we going to Disney? He gets a vision for that fun and we're going to go. We're already reserving the tickets, right? Clear vision gives you motivation to move forward. It's like we're taking that hill and you say, charge, let's go. But most families have no clue what the vision is and what God's vision is for their family. No clue. Wise King Solomon said this in Proverbs. He says, where there is no vision, the people, the family, the marriages perish. Perish. This means when there's no established, no clear vision for your marriage, your family raising your kids, destruction is looming, people. Because you know who has a vision for your family? Satan. And if you don't, he's going to start injecting it in there. Welcome to America today. We have no vision. We're perishing. And Satan goes, well, my vision's being accomplished. It's time to get a vision. Amen? When I ask people, they come to me and say, oh, marriage is struggling. I say, well, what's your vision for your marriage? Like, I didn't know you had a vision for marriage. I guess it's, I hope we stay married. I hope we survive, right? Or what's your vision for your family when they come to me and say, my kids are acting up. Well, I'm, I'm hoping I don't kill any of them before they leave the house. Can I get an amen? <laughs> wow, survival? That reminds me of wedding receptions. You go to wedding receptions, they have the dance where whoever's been married the longest is still standing at the end. And then what do they do? Hey, Joe and Jack and Jill have been married 60 years. What do you do? <clears throat> you applaud, right? Yay, why are you applauding? Because they made it that long. That's the vision? Survival? You don't know if that dude's been sleeping on the couch 40 years. You don't know they actually hate each other. And he, you know, she's tried to kill him twice with arsenic. You don't know this. All you're applauding for is, I hope I can be you one day and just last. That's not a vision, is it? That's a terrible vision. Staying together is not a great vision. Survival, not killing your kids is good. I mean, it'll keep you out of jail, but it's not a vision because they'll most likely do whatever they want to do when they leave. God's vision is so much greater for us people. God's vision for our marriage and our kids, the ones he gave us, is so much greater than the ones we're clamoring for. The Shema passage contains a great vision for Israel to go into a promised land and be effective and thrive and be an impact on the world around them. Guess what? That's his vision for us too. Way bigger than we're making it. He's got a similar vision for us. But do you believe it? Can you actually believe that God's got a great vision for that marriage when you're thinking, I don't know if I can see tomorrow with my marriage? And God's still looking at 50 years for your marriage and the impact you can make. But you've got to believe it. And you've got to sit down and decide, what is the win for my marriage, for my family, for my kids for the next five years, 20 years, 50 years? Make it a big win because that's God's vision for you. So here's what you do. Application point. Sit down with your spouse. If you're not married, sit down with Jesus. If you're engaged, sit down with your fiancé. And when you sit down, you ask Jesus. Just go ahead and say it. Jesus, what is your big vision for this marriage that you've given us? What is your big vision for this family? What is your vision for this child you've blessed us with? And you pray and you write it down. Jesus, what should we be fighting for? in this relationship, in this family. Jesus, give us a vision that'll capture our hearts even more than Disney and a cruise. It'll just make, make us want to fight harder and give more. And you pray and you write it down. I'd love to just break out right now and do this. I do this in our classes, our, our Lead Yourself class. I love whiteboards. I love Post-its. If I had my way and we could be here all day long, we'd be right now at the wall just figuring this stuff out because this matters. 
vision matters or we perish. So I'm, I'm imploring you to do it. You should come up with vision statements like this. In our marriage, we want to look like dot, dot, dot. In our family, we want to be seen as dot, dot, dot. We want to treat each other like dot, dot, dot. We are raising a boy or a girl to be dot, 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 and let God infuse his vision into that. And commit yourselves to it. And think bigger. Don't say, we want to raise responsible kids. Most people don't even know what that means anymore. Responsible is getting up in the morning today, or at least by noon. But you do want a bigger vision than that. Our vision, you know, for me and Holly, and we, we're not perfect by any means, but our marriage, we want to have a marriage that looks so Christ-like that it, that it heals other marriages and leads people to Jesus Christ. We, we look at our kids, and you, you can ask them, we're not just raising you to be successful. We're not raising you to be responsible. We're raising you to be world changers. Have you ever heard that, Chelsea? Like, how many times, Dad? But that's something God pressed upon Holly, and I said, I agree, because we're not just raising up people that can survive in the world. They're going to thrive and change the world. That's a big vision, and I know it seems like a lot of pressure, especially to kids. But you know what? If you have no big vision, you're not going to live for any vision, and you're going to be taken over by the enemy's vision. You'll wake up one day and say, what was this life all about? You don't want to be there. So share this with your family. Get, sit down with it. Write it down and keep bringing it up. Get a vision. Establish the win. The next instruction in your fight plan is to get a fight strategy. Get a fight strategy. Any strategic people in here? I like to know the strategy. I like to know what we're doing and how we're going at it. You know, no general just sends their tanks in, blasting all their artillery. Say, hey, just everyone go in there and start blasting away, you know. Nobody goes into a boxing match. Just swing, 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 right? You need a strategy. You need to know what, what the game plan is and how we're going to go about things, how we're going to move and the environment looks like, how we're going to communicate together when this goes wrong or when the heat comes on. How are we going to do this? That's a strategy. You just don't just go blaring uh, pistols like Yosemite Sam. But that's a lot of parenting today. It's like, bam, 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 I said, now go to your room, no supper. What's the strategy that God wants to give you? I like to communicate strategy as a value system. Have you ever heard me talk about values before? Yeah, a hundred times. I love living by a set of values. Values, because values are the how-to guide to accomplishing the vision. What you hold to is important, and how we process things in different times, whether good times or tense times, are the, are the how-tos or the processes to get us to God's vision for our lives. And that's, that's, so values are not rules. Hey, you know our values, stop hitting your sister. That, that, that's not a value, right? It's more like, hey, we value each other, and therefore, you've obviously frustrated your sister to say something, so why don't you find out what you've done to frustrate her? Because we value each other. The values there, we value each other, and we communicate, okay? So those are different than barking rules. These are ways to process situations to make sure we're moving towards the vision. Does that make sense? I'm kind of giving you a, a six-week class in 40 minutes, so um, keep taking notes. So again, it's not about, Johnny, don't hit your sister. It's not about, all right, kids, I'm taking you out to dinner. You should see, be so blessed, but you better behave and not embarrass me because I don't want other people to think we got rotten kids. That's barking orders, right? No, it's, hey, you know what? There might be broken families around us at this restaurant who know nothing about loving each other. They know nothing about having friendships in the family, you know, and, and we might be able to touch them in some way. That's a value. That's a value that gets us to our purpose and our vision. Does that make sense? So there's a difference. One's a command, and the other, a command that barks orders for behavior, one works into the heart. So everyone's different. And every family needs your own set of values. You need to sit down with your family, with your spouse and your kids, and you need to ask certain questions. I'm going to give you some examples of our values in the Wade family. Again, we're not perfect. These are just things that God's impressed upon us. Whether we verbalize them this clearly or not, we live by them. We've been living by them for years. So I'm going to give you some examples. They're in your notes. One of our values is to be God-centered and God-seeking. God-centered and God-seeking in all we do. Our marriage and our family, our parenting. You know, God says to love him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength so that everything we do comes out of a love for what God wants, 
a love for what God's doing in our family. And so we run everything by God. He's the ultimate leader, amen? So, so many times we make decisions, we do actions without checking in with the very one we're supposed to love and trust and have faith in. So we make a lot of decisions, and then when all goes into chaos and it's all falling around around us, then we say, hey, God, what do you think? He says, I would have loved you to ask me five years ago because <laughs> I would have told you to do some different things. So we want all our decisions and life rhythms to be in alignment with God and his purposes for us, not the world's purposes for us. So we say, what does God think? What would Jesus do in this situation? Those are healthy questions. We want to get God into our relationships, into our kids, into our future. But in order to do that, you know what you need to do? You need to get into his word. You need to get into his word. You need to get your family into his word. He communicates through his word. He communicates through church and people. But when you get your family into the word of God, he communicates to you and directs you more clearly. Does that make sense? You cannot say, well, what would God say? And, and your kids say, how would you know? You, you don't read his word. Oh, right? You, if you're in it, they're like, but let me show you what we did last week, what we studied last month. You remember that time last year? We saw that in the passage. Oh, this makes so much sense right now. Now we can be God-centered and God-seeking. When you wake up, when you, when you lie down, when you walk around, all of life is about God. God-centered and God-seeking. That's value number one. Value number two, we want to be authentic and real. Authentic and real. We don't want to be one way around our kids and another way somewhere else. We don't want to be fake with our faith and hide our feelings. If we do that, they're going to do that too. And they know it when we're fake. They know it when we're hiding. So why even do it? Why not just be authentic and real? The whole idea is to know and be known by one another. If you don't really know your kids, they don't really know you. It means you're not really being authentic and you're not being real. Right? You don't want to be the family that finds out too late when something's been wrong because everything's swept under the rug and you're not being real. Okay? Even in ministry, we tried our best to rejoice when we're rejoicing, and when we've, when we've been hurting, we, we hurt. We come together, and we hurt, and we just express that. We don't do it in a way to embitter anyone towards ministry of God, but we want to be real, and then we show grace. There was a time in our lives when we found out some things about our boys that they had been molested, and it really sent me and Holly into a season of anger, a season of frustration with God, and we, we just went into protection mode, and we put on a smile, right? I mean, that's good. We're, we're smiling, but what I found out later is Cassidy, my daughter, was given a testimony, and part of that season for her was a real crisis of belief because mom and dad all of a sudden were fake, and she didn't know us. And she went through a real crisis moment, and she had to really grab a hold of God. And when we pulled out of that and got some healing and we started becoming real again, she started finding better healing. But, she, but she, she went through a real moment when we stopped being authentic and real for her. That was a hard, time for, hard thing for us to hear, but it was a good reminder of who we want to be. It's to be authentic and real. We strive for intentional communication. How many people communicate with your kids? I th everyone communicates with your kids. <laughs> but the two words there, intentional communication, are huge. They're, 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 they're like dynamite, right? I, I see people spend more time and intentionality on the car they're going to buy than the communication or the conversation they're going to have with their kids. They'll spend 30 minutes looking at the new thing on Amazon. Their kids walk by and, hey, how you doing? Good, okay. It is seconds. Right? We're so intentional about what we're doing, and we don't end up fully communicating with our kids. And I don't mean first layer communication. We do this all the time. How's your day? How's your first uh, week of school? Great. Oh, I'm so glad. Praise God. First layer, communication. Second layer and third layer is where you want to go. Ask questions beyond the first layer. I'm going to give you some examples, and, and I'm going to just... Uh, um, laud on Holly a little bit because she is so good at this. She doesn't just say, how was your day? She says, what's the best thing that's happened to you this week? What's the thing that's frustrated you the most this week? I love when she asks, what's one thing that's troubling you about God in your life right now? A faith question. What's one thing that's got you worried right now? A stress of life question. You go deeper. 
You take the time. The other thing we believe in is equip and invest for growth. We believe we're supposed to be learning and growing all the time. And so we equip and invest for growth. And the last one, encouragement. We strive to celebrate and encourage constantly, constantly. If there's one thing your spouse, your family, your kids are hearing all day long, it's negativity, not positivity. From friends, from the world, from the enemy, all day long about you, about your relationship, about your family, about life. The one characteristic, the one tool you have to thwart that is your encouragement. Amen? Hebrews chapter 3 says this, Encourage one another daily as long as it's called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. How often are we supposed to encourage one another? How often? Do you know this is the one characteristic out of all the godly characteristics in the Bible, the one, the one that actually thwart sinful mindsets. It's actually the one characteristic that can keep people from falling prey to the enemy. Now flip that around. If there are people in your life, in your family, that are falling prey, that are acting up, disbehaving, having a bad season, is it because, or partly because, they're void of your encouragement? All they're hearing is your complaining. It's a, it's a refocus, right? We always encourage. We'll even sit around the dinner table and make everyone go around and say one encouraging thing about somebody else. One encouraging thing about one of your siblings or mom and dad, just to keep encouraging one another. We always want to encourage. The last one is unconditional love, just like Jesus Christ. Your family, your spouse should always know, no matter what, no matter what, if they're shining like a star or they're failing bad, they're loved, they're accepted, they're welcome at the table. My son, I talked to him about this. He, he went through a couple of years where he was just off the rails. And Holly and I would just pray for him and pray for him and pray for him like, oh my goodness, this kid, kid's either gonna die on a motorcycle or something bad's gonna happen. We'd pray for him. He sits, come back and, and, and living out it's such a great life with my daughter-in-law. But he told me a couple years back, he said, Dad, I always knew this. No matter what I was doing, whatever my behavior was, I always knew I could come back to you and you'd say, I love you. Welcome back. And that kept me from going over the line. Unconditional love. That's to get a strategy. Here's what you do. You sit down with your spouse, with your family, and you say, what do we hold dear? How do we want to treat and live with one another that's going to help us accomplish God's vision for our life? What do we need to do in our life? How do we need to act? What kind of decisions do we need to make to make sure we're helping each other move forward and write it down? And then everything, every decision, every, every fight comes back to a value because that's not who we are. Remember, we decided we're not that way. We're going over here. We're not going that direction. And you hold to your values until God helps you accomplish the vision for your life. I'm going to give you one last instruction for your fight plan, and this is the biggie. This is the biggie. If you really want things to change with your marriage, your children, or the future of this country even, I said it, even the future of this country, you need to lead the fight. You need to lead the fight. Someone has got to lead this fight in your family, in your marriage. Notice I didn't say pick the fight. Notice I didn't say instigate a fight. We do a lot of that. I said lead the fight. No one's leading. Kids need to see an authority in the family that says, follow me. I'm going ahead. I didn't say a boss but someone who has well thought out, well prayed out plan and sets the strategy and say, let's go. So they can learn to trust in you and they'll even submit to you because you've got it from God himself and you're going this way and it's for their benefit, their behalf. Kids need to see that. They need to see that before you become friends with them. Amen? They need to say, you, they see you can take the lead 
so that they can say, I trust you, I submit to you. If you don't do this, you're setting them, them up for failure in the future where they'll never submit to authority and they won't believe in a God who won't give them everything they want and they'll turn away. You want to lead the way. You want to say, let's go. But if you're going to win the hearts of these children, of your, of your family, listen, you've got to do it first. Our passage today, each sentence is in the imperative. If you're a grammar snob like me, imperative means you can put a you right before every verb. Any grammar people? You. So let's reread it. You love the Lord the God with all your heart. You love him with all your strength. You love him with all your mind and your soul. You sit down and get him in your hearts. You get him into your kids' hearts. You did the, You do this. Because God knows, and he's telling you that you need to be the one who leads this fight. You can't sit back and keep complaining. You've got to take up the fight and lead it. You cannot expect your kids to follow a plan that you're not following. So many people come me fretting about their kids who aren't fully committed to God, and I look at their lives and I'm saying, well, they're following you because you're not fully committed to God. Well, I go to church on Sunday, at least twice a month. Listen, fully committed, fully in love, heart, soul, mind, and strength to God, to Jesus, and leading your family in this way. That's going to the next level. That's making a change. That's making a difference, and that'll change the world. It's the only thing that will change the world because no one's doing that in the world. We are the change agent that God has for this world. If you want things to change, you have to change. I'll say it more boldly. If you don't choose to sacrifice self, you're going to sacrifice families and kids and their future. We need self-sacrificial leaders. God showed us the way, amen, through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was in heaven, Philippians 2, and he gave up the throne. He gave up a place in heaven. He's with the Father, the Holy Spirit, the angels. You think he didn't have something better to do to come down than this place? He gave all that up. He put the throne on hold to come down here and live a life, lead the way, and give himself, his whole self, on the cross so that it would capture and win your hearts, not your behavior, your hearts. And guess what? It worked because that's the plan. And you know what he says when he rises from the dead? Your turn. Leave something. Leave your throne. Leave whatever you got going on. Whatever it might be. It might be the next promotion, the next career, the next position, the, the next comfort zone. Whatever is on your heart and mind and you're putting so much energy into it. Maybe he's saying maybe that throne has to be left. Come down and sacrifice and see what difference it might make. Because it made a difference in your life when I did it. I don't know what that looks like for you. I don't know what you need to put on hold. I know for me, three years ago, I felt God telling me to do something. I don't know of a better marriage than mine and Holly's, but our marriage was drifting. And I looked at God and I said, I don't like how this is drifting, God. And he says, well, isn't that the most important thing to you? To be united with one and, and how I'm gonna use you? I said, yes. He said, well, maybe you gotta put something aside and I stepped down from being lead pastor. And there are some other reasons, but that was a big one. Step down from leadership to make sure the marriage can continue on in accomplishing his vision. Self-sacrifice means you're going to step down from those things and say, I'm here for you, whatever it takes. Maybe you got to shut TV off. Maybe you got to stop a hobby. Maybe you got to create a hobby. Maybe you got to go outside and play. I love Ryan and, and Chelsea who started the outdoor fam from Friday night to Sunday night. You turn your phones off and you just go outside and you be with your family. And I know, oh, I don't want to do this, mom or dad, but you just keep doing it and you just keep doing it. It becomes who you are. It's your new value system. And then you see the results. What does that look like for you? What do you need to give up to lead the way so that others will follow? What do you need to put aside like Jesus say, it's worth me being all in? this week, this month, for the next five years. 
Because I'm telling you, the only thing that's going to make an exponential difference in this world right now and when you go off to be in heaven will be your sacrifice in leading the way. Lead the fight. There's a war on people. This is a battle zone. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. Principalities and powers of the dark world. And it's going to take something besides the flesh to win. It can be sacrifice and let's fight in the spirit. Amen. Rise up with me. Father, we just thank you for a time that we can just be challenged about the country we live in, the families that we have, and what we hold dear, what you hold dear. Get back to the roots of the Shema where we can actually love you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love one another as ourselves. Get God, get you into our hearts and get you into our children and our marriages and start living centered around you, seeking you, and catch a vision that you have for everything you've given us and fight for it. Lord, we, we know with just 12 men, Jesus, 12 men that you taught to sacrifice themselves, turn the world upside down. And there's way more than 12 in this room, Jesus. I'm praying it starts here. I'm praying this week we'd actually sit down with our families, our spouses, our kids, and say what matters most to God and to us. What needs to change, kids? What needs to happen? And start doing it. I pray for the results because it's what you want. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to worship. I'm going to ask you if God's pressed upon you to lay yourself down, to lay something in your life down, you're going to enter a war. I'm going to ask you to come down and get prayed over. Just going to gather up here, and we're going to sing, and then I'm going to pray over families, pray over husbands and wives.